So I want to do a, a little bit of a report to people here about some of our local news. And there's a lot happening um, in the area of pushback against wind and solar at the moment, where the best way I could describe it is we're in the teeth of a gale at the moment. We've been talking about these projects, um, and now they seem to be coming at us um, from all over the place. So our chance to register objections is, uh, is becoming quite an issue for us. So what I'd like to do for everyone is to say a warm welcome first to Greg for doing this at an unsociable hour. We really appreciate it. And I think you'll see just how important this uh, link we have to Greg is once we get going, because all the um, concepts that we had for community engagement and the thoughts and plans that we had for the future are pretty much identical to what you guys have done. So you've been there, done that. Quite frankly, we want to learn uh, from you um, and, uh, you know, hopefully forge a, a network link in, in the process. But firstly, uh, with these endless, seemingly endless, um, uh, well, really, there are projects to be approved. They have a discussion phase. They have a feedback phase. People have a chance to lodge objections. They're coming at warp speed. And sometimes uh, we have very little time to react. Uh, the most recent for me was Friday afternoon when I was asked to complete something via email by five o'clock and I only got it away at 4.30. Uh, now, in our state, um, I don't know, Kevin, if you can show this uh, slide to people. That was the one that I was asking for yeah. uh, regarding the sheer amount of these, these projects um, that are happening. Uh, so what I want to do is institute a thing for us whereby a thread mail, so... This way, people, some people use Facebook, some don't use Facebook, but I'm going to send it round to everyone and encourage them to add even a short note. It's a numbers game. Uh, you know, some detailed people like uh, Carolyn up at Chilumban, you know, answered a 1,600-page document, you know, in full. Um, I tend to make a, a statement. I've actually got a slide of what I wrote uh, in opposition uh, to this thing called, I don't know if you have it in the States, it's called social license. Social license means that, um, you know, if people don't object, then they're meant to go along with it. And if some people have been paid off by the developers and think it's fine and dandy, uh, and other people don't say no, then the government thinks, oh, well, we're building social license. Nothing could be further from the truth. So um, in terms of what's been happening uh, in these areas, this is just more local stuff, Greg. We have a relationship going, as most people know, in far north Queensland with Stephen Nowakowski, who's quite the activist these days, and he's a videographer who has made some excellent uh, videos of before and after on these projects, and Carolyn. Um, Cedric, we know well at Biloela. I've now forged a link with a lady called Jan Waldron uh, from this area called Kilkeven, I think it is, which runs from uh, around about Gympie to up around Bundaberg Way. Now, they're the ones who are directly affected by these transmission lines. This is where the government comes in and said, we just want to uh, have access to your property. And uh, part of that, of course, destroys the nature of the property. It can't be uh, controlled in bushfire conditions or overhead spraying. And, uh, you know, there was a big protest in that area against it. Um, and it's coming back, of course. Uh, as our outgoing Labor government, or we certainly hope it is, um, decide to plant as many um, landmines and hand grenades as they can before they leave in March. So there's that one. Um, also, uh, the Wednesday meeting, as I think I mentioned, that was in terms of um, 
Stephen and this guy, David Gillespie, giving a talk down at Southweed Sports Club. Uh, a number of us are going along. It's uh, well, well worthwhile. And also um, a uh, link that I've forged, and it wasn't me who made it, it was someone who put me together. Uh, we have a, a zone, Greg, called Port Stevens. It's like a retirement and uh, tourist place just north of Sydney. It's idyllic. It's idyllic. Now, Australia, believe it or not, does not have any offshore um, wind. And so this is the first attempt made to get one of these awful projects through. And so uh, I've been talking to a guy called Ben Abbott, uh, who I was put together with, and uh, we've hit quite a quite a vibe. I, I want everyone involved there if there's a chance to um, add comments to that. He showed me what the prospectus of the carpet baggers was. It was 150 odd shiny pages of prospectus material, not worth the paper it wasn't written on, and it could all be demolished with the very first line. They said, in justification for what they're doing, overseas wind is booming, booming. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It's really tanking. Uh, Greg would appreciate this more than most. Um, and it's down a lot of times not to concern for the marine life uh, and the ugliness and impact on tourism. It's down to money. Uh, because offshore wind is, is three times uh, as expensive as wind on land. And one of the major areas that they've got to consider costs on is these uh, undersea cables. Now, if they break, and they do, it's not really a question of if, it's more a question of when. They take months to fix. Uh, during that time, of course, that particular unit isn't productive at all. You're not getting paid anything. And the costs of this, and this was uh, the London-based uh, trade and industry fair for offshore wind said, pretty soon this element of RE will become unsustainable due to rising insurance costs because insurers hate to pay, <laughs> hate to pay for what um, they, uh, you know, assess as a, as a risk. So what we've got to do there is to point all this out. It's uh, uneconomic, it's failing. In the US recently, there was only one bid for three projects. You'd know this one well in the Gulf of Mexico. Got that bid for 5.6 million. No bids at all for the Atlantic coast. Um, so, you know, far from being the next big thing that Australia must stupidly latch onto. And they want to get this one up. If they get this one up, they've got a whole bunch of them in the pipeline. This is really the most important element of pushback, including Port of Brisbane and other places uh, in Queensland. So there's no, no, no end to it there. Also, and really uh, to wrap this one up, there's a big rally in Sydney happening at the end of November. And that rally uh, will be from all the community groups in the rural and regional areas. I don't know if they're going to bring their tractors like they did in Melbourne, but, um, you know, it's going to be held in Martin Place. I'm involved in, in the discussion phase with that. One of the areas, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, Greg could offer a comment on this, that I um, have been suggesting we push, and it's, uh, it's getting the nod, is to have a couple of, uh, petitions for people to sign up to and the first will be a chance to express support for a moratorium on all renewable projects uh, due to a whole host of very valuable uh, reasons that we have uh, and secondly is one uh, I have this notion and I've had it for a while this thing I call code blue uh, now, when Guterres got up and made this nonsense statement about its code red for humanity, that's before we're all going to hell in a handbasket, um, I thought, well, the best way I could express what we're on about and what we're on about is there's no climate emergency is code blue. 
And so uh, the second petition, and this would be an e-petition to go to both the lower house and the Senate, um, would be that people in the community have a chance to agree. So this isn't just 1,800 well-credentialed scientists and professionals. It's um, people in the general community uh, saying, we don't believe there's a climate emergency. Now, you can even accept that maybe this human-induced CO2 has some part to play. That doesn't matter as long as there's no climate emergency. Uh, and that's amply backed up by details of uh, climatic records and, and all of the above. So um, thanks for all that. That's kind of a fill-in. I'm sorry, I'm looking around at everyone. Uh, can you excuse me for one minute, Greg, because I have a, a notebook. I've got 10 points that I wanted to ask you about. And uh, I don't want to forget any of them. So uh, the first one um, handing over to you would be um, your... Um, Oh, that's mine. Your own career earlier on as, as a geologist, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about that, you uh, were responsible for founding this company, and correct me if I'm wrong, called um, Mount, Mountaineer Keystone, uh, which looked at oil and, and gas with uh, shale deposits. And I was also wondering the use, because I'm not a geologist, I was wondering the use of the word Keystone, did that have any connection or planned connection with the Keystone pipeline out west? So I'll hand over to you. Well, the, the Keystone part of it uh, uh, refers to the Keystone state of Pennsylvania, uh, which was uh, my, my home was was in the state of Pennsylvania. It was called the Keystone State because it was the it was the center of the original thirteen colonies, uh, uh, and we answered to the to the queen as well or the king at that time rather. So it was the middle of the thirteen colonies and called the Keystone. Uh, so I was a I was a, there was a natural gas. I was at the forefront of the shale gas and fracking revolution uh, that really just revolutionized the energy business uh, and did that for after I left uh, Mountaineer Keystone I, uh, I I really dove into this I, I knew that some of what we were being told about climate change was just wrong in particular was ocean acidification as a geologist I knew that the oceans had had never been acidified they've all, always been firmly um, alkaline uh, they went to the basic side rather than the acidic side always, even at, at times when CO2 levels were six and seven times what they are today. Um, so I knew that. And it was my, this was my first book was Inconvenient Fat. Um, and I was driven to, to write that book out of this, my own personal exploration uh, for the truth about climate change. And I went back. I didn't trust anybody at the beginning. I said, I'm, I'm going to dive in and look at the base data myself. And and what I did, frankly, angered me. Uh, I found that most, much of what we're being told about the subject was just wrong. We were being misinformed or disinformed. Um, and I was driven to write this book. In fact, the book it just had its seventh publication anniversary last week. Um, and that coincided as back to, as a number one bestseller on Amazon in two categories after seven years. So it's been very warmly received. Um, it was written uh, for non-scientists. Uh, I, I don't dumb anything down, but I make things understandable. And in fact, my my second book is a very convenient warming. Uh, we've just received two days ago, it's timely, our first pre-publication orders of a very convenient warming. The subtitle is How Modest Warming and more CO2 are benefiting humanity. And that's really our story here at the CO2 Coalition. And our mantra is, uh, our unofficial motto is, we love CO2 and so should you. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Actually, that's a whole area that I had down as uh, 
one of the points I wanted you to talk on. Um, I, well, given that you've mentioned the book, uh, both books, let me just ask you firstly, um, what sort of a, a response with those good sales figures with the first one, the inconvenient facts? Are you getting people you know, joining up or uh, wanting to get involved in some form of um, activity? Absolutely. We've, we've seen explosive growth. I took over here three years ago at the CO2 Coalition, and uh, it's the response we've gotten has been incredible. Uh, both our, We have a, a newsletter that I send out uh, once a week, and un, it's unusual in that we don't send this out going, please send us money, please send us money, and we're really good, you need to do this. We're, it's not what this is about. Our newsletter my goal is when you open this newsletter up and you read it, you're going to go, Hold on. I didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? And so we, we put uh, interesting things that you probably don't know. Like this, this week's newsletter uh, was with the lead was the worst year ever. And it's related uh, to the dark ages. We know that a big part of the second book uh, the second sec second of three sections deals with the strong relationship between the rise and fall of temperature and the rise and fall of civilizations. And uh, if you're curious, the worst year ever, the general consensus, if you will, was the year 536. And it was it was the beginning, the beginning of the uh, the first of the plagues, the bubonic plague. Uh, but it was related to the cold that it, that set in after the beneficial worm, warmth of the Roman warm period. And so it's a strong story that needs to be told. We need to look at history and what does history tell us? Uh, history tells us that we should welcome the warmth and fear the cold, because that's what we've seen through the last 5,000 years, dating back to the first great civilizations. We know those great civilizations that rose up the first were in the Minoan warm period or the Bronze Age. Those are the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Hittites. Uh, those are the great empire the, of the, the Harappan in the Indus River Valley and the Chinese. All of these great civilizations rose up in a much, much warmer time period than it is today. And then it all collapsed within a period of maybe less than 100 years. It started to cool down. And it, it led to what was called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, cause of the cold temperatures. Isn't it just opposite of what we're being told? So once again, welcome the warmth and fear the cold. Couldn't be more true. I read all your newsletters and I remember that recent one on the uh, the worst day in history in terms of um, climate, the uh, volcano eruption that, that most likely coincided with that. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's... Can I ask you, and again, I was going to do this more towards the end, but since we're talking books and all that, um, you're off to London soon, I understand. Is that going to be in conjunction with the release of this book as well, or is that on uh, more general matters? It's, it's more general matters. I had an opportunity. Uh, I've got a private dinner meeting in London with... Uh, with Nigel Farage and a number of members of parliament from the UK. Um, she'll be doing that on October 31st. Uh, I've got a separate meeting later next week uh, with, with members of parliament from your own Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Um, oh, we've got a, a lengthy meeting. I hope to be talking sense to them. And uh, I, I'm arranging... Uh, interviews with GB TV, which is one of the big TV. Uh, hopefully, Nigel Farage, an interview with him. Uh, we're arranging other, hopefully, hope, hoping to connect with uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, while I'm there, there's a large uh, convention that he's organized, a number of people are attending. And uh, so I'm there. It was an opportunity to meet with these people, and I had to go. And that's that part of my mission in the CO2 coalition uh, to reach out around the world. But we, we're primarily focused in the United States. That, that's where we're based. But we have uh, we have members all over the world, including, you know, your own Dr. Peter Ridd, 
Um, sure. He was a member here. We have other members from, from Australia. And as a member, these are mostly <clears throat> scientists or experts of some type, uh, well known in their field. Uh, we have more than 150 of these top experts. Like Dr. Peter Ridd and I, he's just agreed to work with me on a, we have a series of, of science-based comic books that are done manga style. Uh, we're, I'm starting a new series. It's called the Sleep, I'm calling it the Sleep Well series. The first is Chloe the Clownfish Sleeps Well at Night. And it, the, the base of it is that Chloe learned in school that uh, her home on the Great Barrier Reef was, was in danger uh, being destroyed by human-caused climate change. And uh, she went home and tell, told her mother she was so worried she couldn't sleep. And luckily, Dr. Peter Ridd was going to be visiting their very own reef the next week. And so we're going to have Dr. Peter Ridd come down and talk to the school. And we're not sure how it's all going to be put together, but uh, he'll be providing some of the science. So we'll be able to use this storyline to teach science to children, you know, teach them about ocean acidification, about how the Great Barrier Reef is at its greatest extent since they've been taking these studies for the last 30 or 40 years that um, the their, her home on the reef is is not in danger. Uh, so we're going to use that. That's a whole storyline uh, mm. we're going to use with these different types of animals, you know, Otto, the sea otter and things like that. Yeah, that that is all great. That's another one of our desires and we'd like to... Um, you know, tap into the work that you're doing and and uh, show you some of the uh, rather left field ideas I've come up with as well. You know, a climate rap song, I think, is uh, is overdue. <laughs> um, so, can I just uh, thank you very much for that, by the by? And um, you know, I understand too the possibility of you coming out here, Australia, at some stage. Uh, so, you know. Please keep us in the loop. We'd love to you know, talk further on that one. Um, I want to talk to you about the um, National Climate Assessment uh, reports that you put out. Now, that would have, have obvious um, crossover effects for what we've got here. I listened to um, a 20-minute-odd video uh, of you explaining what you've done and getting the accurate records, um, you know, ignoring what the opposition have done with their urban heat island effects and their tendency to uh, just, well, outright fudge the data. You know, they want to show warming. They want to show an increasing slope on the graph uh, just so it impacts on people. And, of course, it's usually the reverse when you drill right down. And one of my own personal favourites who is involved in this, that's Tony Heller, you know, a member of your group. Uh, no one collects historical records, I think, better than Tony. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you've covered, um, what was it, the Midwest? It, or certainly in the video I listened to, it was the Midwest. Uh, I think we could do something here in Australia along those lines. Yeah, I we're we're doing a whole series of state and regional studies for the United States. Uh, you're talking about uh, climate change in the mid American Midwest. Uh, Life in America's breadbasket is good and getting better was the subtitle, and that's what we see repeated mm. time and time again. So we've we've done these series. Uh, the first was from from my home state, Pennsylvania. Uh, in order to provide the science to push back on what they were calling the regional greenhouse gas initiative and this is a series of now i think 10 or 14 states in the united states on the east coast have banded together in this co-op really it's its objective is to raise energy price electricity costs and they're doing that by imposing carbon taxation schemes pennsylvania was going to move into that and we did our first state re and regional study was there, and we provided state specific information to push back. Uh, we could be used by the legislature and the governor there to fight it. Um, and it, we were very successful. I, I testified 
uh, in front of the state house, which uh, I'm not sure if you have that opportunity there. We had we had friends in this particular state uh, in the energy committee. The chairman was a good friend of mine, and he just he loved our message, and so he would get us. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to testify. Um, we did the same thing for, I'm calling you from the state of Virginia, uh, just out of DC, beside DC. And in fact, my office, uh, when I, when I'm in my office, I, I, I look over the, the swamp. I can see the Capitol and the Washington Monument and Jefferson Memorial from my office quite clearly. And, uh, we did one for the state of Virginia. We have our new governor, Youngkin, that's now pushing back against the Virginia Clean Energy Act and also REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So I was down and testified in our state house of Richmond. Uh, we, we, again, did specific report. And that's what we do is provide the science, the facts, and the data to push back. And we're going to do a whole series of these. There's no reason we couldn't do something like that for Australia as well, or even a, a specific state of a, or a province and part of part of parts of Australia. Um, so we, we could talk to you about that. Thank you, because that we had we're forming a steering committee to get together to form the climate and energy realists of Australia to represent really an overriding umbrella. There's a whole bunch of people um, who are out there operating excellent blogs, doing wonderful research, uh, some other people operating in groups. I know uh, Peter and Jennifer Marahasi operate within the IPA, um, but there's a lot of people um, involved in this, and we're trying to give them an umbrella organisation that will answer to our equivalent. And our equivalents are called the Clean Energy Council, and that's Tim Flannery, uh, mostly, and um, also the uh, Clean Energy um, Council. So, uh, you know, both of, the, uh, both of those areas. So I'll talk a bit more about that, what we have, our plans are. But yes, a big yes to that in terms of linking with you in this study, both by state and um, other areas. It would give us a, a real push forward. That was one of the things that I'd listed um, as uh, an initiative that I thought uh, should be Australia-wide and get as many people involved because a lot of people have... Um, contributions to make you know there's a, some classic stories so uh, one recently happened where this guy up in Cairns, who's one of our regulars said um, <clears throat> he was uh, going out to this town in the outback called Cloncurry and he was going to get records that showed in 18 I don't know 96 or something there was indeed uh, record high temperatures and that the attempt to squelch these things down by cherry picking dates or just ignoring them. And so the people at Cloncurry uh, Station said, yes, no, we'd be happy to provide you with the written record. And he said, great. They said, oh, just give us 20 bucks and we'll post it to you. And the next thing, the person got on the phone almost in tears and said, it's gone missing. You know, the whole... Thing which we had in writing has gone missing. You know, it, it's some of this stuff's just outrageous. I'm sure there's way more anecdotes that we can pull together. Um, we'd love the sort of um, platform that you're given to answer, you know, Senate inquiries or presentations to um, to politicians. Um, in fact, we really would love to hear what your <laughs> interactions are like with the Australian politicians. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. That's a separate area uh, for me. Um, I also wanted to talk about the uh, the quiz, the climate quiz that you have, uh, because I've done one myself independently. Um, I had it as a, uh, a multiple choice um, and um, you know, it was along the lines of this um, quiz show that we have where people get four choices each time. Uh, we've test run it on a small audience a couple of times where 
we say, here, fill out this climate quiz. And then I give them a feedback at the end and you get your score. And I'm able to say, well, you know, even five isn't bad. Isn't bad. Uh, now, I don't know what um, end you're making of your climate quiz. Is that giving you people making inquiries to CO2 coalition as well or giving it to general audiences to get them more, you know, more knowledgeable? How, how are you using that? Well, people are actually, they, they, we've gotten a good response from that. That's up on our website, the climate quiz. Mm. Uh, so just get, it's another opportunity. People, it's something fun that they can test their own knowledge yes. about climate change. Like there are 15 questions or so. Uh, that's complemented by another page called the Climate Facts, uh, where I've posted or we've post, posted some significant information. These are easily understood charts uh, that are fully sourced and referenced. And uh, we've we've provided that again. A lot of this information was culled from my book um, and also from, with help from many of the other uh, experts we have here at the CO2 Coalition. Right. Um, also, I was very interested in this uh, Science Teachers Annual Conference where you manage to get into it, as it were, uh, to have a, a stand uh, where you could distribute information. And I know it's a matter of record that they ejected you uh, the next day, you personally. Uh, I was interested to find out what the response was like during the first day when you were handing out your material. Some of our members, actually many of our members, were concerned about the state of the science education, particularly in America, uh, where our children were being indoctrinated and taught groupthink. Uh, they were being indoctrinated into this climate change cult and prevented from hearing any science that was contrary to man-made catastrophic warming. Uh, and it was, it was, it's really bad. Uh, here in the United States, I don't know how it is in Australia, but we've got a, a large and growing homeschool movement. There's also what's called a charter school movement where they have these separate charter schools away from the public school. They're still into the public school umbrella, but they have greater latitude. Um, so we our our goal here, we don't, we have a problem getting our information into the public schools because they're so rigidly controlled. Uh, and so what we decided to do was launch this uh, educational initiative. And I'm so proud of what our people have done. We have 15 of our scientists. Most of these are PhD scientists, chemists, physicists. I'm a geologist. Um, we, it, it, what we've done is just, these, these people have done is just incredible. Um, I'm so proud. You'd think that 15 PhDs would be a bunch of eggheads that couldn't get anything done. Well, you'd be surprised with what they uh, as flag waving activists put it that way. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, we've done is it's incredible. We found uh, Dr. Rafaela Nascimento is one of our co-chairs. She's from uh, from Brazil, uh, and located a brilliant Brazilian artist that I've brought on as a full time staff member as our senior uh, arts advisor. He's wonderfully talented and we've done a series of of comic science-based comic books that are done manga style another series of videos that are done anime style and the children just love these um and uh, importantly we have companion lesson plans that go along with each of these videos and books uh, these these lesson plans were created by dr sharon camp who has a phd in analytic chemistry uh she was an advanced placement science teacher. She actually taught advanced placement science for a number of years, uh, retired last year. We brought her on. She's now our senior education advisor. Uh, and uh, she's created these lesson plans uh, that people are using. And again, this large and growing homeschool movement, all of my grandchildren are homeschooled, I'm, I'm proud to say. Uh, my daughter was uh, an educator, and she's uh, she's the mama bear that looks out after our children. And my grandchildren, and she's a wonderful teacher to them. Our, just last year, our five-year-old oldest granddaughter 
was reading, which at our, I don't know if about Australia, but at the fourth grade level at five years old, uh, which is five years ahead of where she would have been. Uh, in fact, she read our very first book that I brought. I brought, I was going to read it to her. It was called uh, Once Upon a Time, The True Story of Carbon Dioxide, The Miracle Molecule. And I sat down, she goes, no, Baba, let me read it to you. And then this was, she was four years old at the time. Wow. And she read through the entire book to me. She only stumbled over two words, photosynthesis and veterinarian. And so she's, that our books are, and they're cap, the books are captivating. Um, so we, we have this series, uh, we, we have these, uh, and we went to the National Science Teaching Association's annual convention in March yeah. with our material. Uh, before going, I looked at the NSTA's policy on climate change, and it was just horrific, horrific. They flatly stated that uh, there is no dispute about climate change and that any, any sign, any Supposed science that disagrees with this is disinformation and pseudoscience uh, that it must not be allowed in the classroom. And it was just horrific. And so we we put a put a published the first day, it was the published date of our paper that was called Challenging the National Science Teaching Association's Policy Statement on Climate Change. And we published it and had that up at their own convention, criticizing their policy on climate change. And we, the teachers flocked to our table. We had a double booth. Uh, the reception we got from the teachers themselves was tremendous. Just uh, on the, the morning of the second day of the convention, we had just distributed uh, all of our materials, with the exception of this, this paper that we had, uh, and we're, our discussion was, what are we going to do now when we're approached by the chief operating officer of the NSTA and three security officials? And he said, you need to remove your materials. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And he said, he says, no, you have to take them down. This is our convention. And you're putting up material that's critical of what of what we do and what we say. And I said, that's correct, because you're wrong. And he says, you need you need to take them down or leave. And I said, sir, you're kicking us out of your convention. He said, that's right. We're kicking you out. You must leave. And so uh, we did. We packed up and got out. Uh, it was empowering. It really was. Okay. We walked out with our head high. We wore it as a badge of honor. Uh, we're going to go. We've been to a couple other homeschool conventions where everybody welcomes us. Uh, we'll be going to the... Uh, we're going in uh, a few weeks to, to Houston, Texas, where we'll be exhibiting at, at a state uh, large convention there. Uh, I'm not, I don't think we'll be kicked out, but uh, it won't be as warm of a welcome as we get at the home homeschooling event. So I'm really proud of I'm really, really proud of what we've done. And you could learn more if you want to see that. Go to co2learningcenter.com. CO2learningcenter.com uh, to learn more about that. It's we're, we're just beginning. We just rolled this website out just recently. No, that's just great. I mean, we want to learn from you. Um, we're, you know, considerably behind and a slightly different scenario uh, here. I don't know the strength of homeschooling um, movement in Australia, uh, as a matter of fact, my my number two, who can't make it today, she's more likely to be knowledgeable about this, um, but we maybe need to start there. Um, I had an opportunity recently. There was a schoolboy uh, in Brisbane, that's our capital, state capital city, not too far away, who started this movement off his own back, well, Nuclear for Australia. And uh, he managed to get uh, a bunch of signatures, 5,000 odd. Uh, he's a year 11 schoolboy. And he went down to our um, national capital in Canberra and presented his case before uh, a Senate committee. 
and uh, he was also became a little bit of a media sensation. All the mainstream channels had him on. He actually appeared on the left wing um, ABC. He probably got the equivalent in the States, PBS or something. And, um, you know, they have a show called Q&A, which is usually loaded up um, against it. They had the minister, uh, Chris Bowen, that nobody can stand. <laughs> he always gets a reaction just saying his name. Uh, and he said, look, it's a one-page document This uh, to rescind um, the ban on, on developing nuclear energy. We've got loads of uranium, by the way. Uh, and he said, here, and he scratched it up and threw it on the floor. He can tear it up right now. It, you know, that sort of thing was good. Now, I was going to get him along for our meeting, and I'd asked um, three related private schools if they would distribute this amongst the students because here's a fellow student. And the administrators that I talked to all said, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if they understood exactly what we're on about, but that doesn't matter. Uh, in the end, I got to pull out because of exam pressure or, or whatever, but we've got to find ways. Uh, when you say charter schools, I don't know exactly if we have that equivalent here. What what are they? Well, they're under the rubrics of the of the public school, but they're they're independent and have a little bit more autonomy uh, to do what they wish. These typically um, might have a certain focus, uh, whether it be trades or science, um, what you will. And I, I'm not a, I'm I'm I don't know as much about them as I do about the homeschool. But the charter school movement is. Uh, the charter schools are huge and growing, and uh, it's it's a they're done by I believe by lottery. Uh, there's such a demand to get into these uh, because the, in the United States the public school systems some are very good, some are most and many particularly in the inner cities, uh, and that's where we see the the great demand for these charter schools that the parents just don't want. Uh, their children in these inner city schools. So we've uh, inner cities, of course, are driven by mainly minority communities. Uh, so uh, this, this separate education is is in huge demand by uh, the African American, Hispanic communities, and the other uh, minority communities in the United States in these inner cities. They just they want better for their children. They want they don't want their children trapped in this cycle of poverty and, and low education. Okay. Well, great. It, it probably represents a, a good opportunity, uh, you know, to work with. I was just informed by Kevin that we can do that. Yeah, that right? Chef, yeah, the, uh, enabled chef. We just hit, it it hit. turned out, uh, Greg, for your information as well, when you go down to the bottom of Zoom, there's a, a little icon called Security, and as the person who owns the session, I just had to click on that, and now I've enabled you to share screen. So could we try sharing a screen just to see if we've managed that miracle? Yeah, I, I can see I can do that. We've yeah. already talked about the education system. I don't know if there's something else I could share my screen. Perhaps I could share uh, I have a series of slides that on CO2 versus temperature through time. If you would like to take a look yep. at that, yeah, sure. I think these are it's and, and these. And let me share screen. Yeah, it's working. Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is uh, what we'll do is take a. Journey through through uh, time, CO2 versus temperature. Um, the first one I want to show you is uh, the anything you see in these charts, the blue line are represents carbon dioxide. The red lines are temperature. And so this is an important chart. Just as we started adding carbon dioxide in significant amounts to the atmosphere in the mid 20th century, just as we started increasing CO2, we went into a 33-year cooling trend. And so this chart here goes from 1944 to 1978, representing 33 years. You can see that 
CO2 levels significantly increased. These are emissions uh, that are listed on the on the right there, uh, not CO2 in the atmos atmosphere, but rather how much we were emitting. Um, and again, the red line here is the Ag crude for temperature data set. This is global temperature, showing that while CO2 increased, temperature decreased. Um, you know, that's pretty hard to explain. Next, we'll take a little bit longer look here at carbon dioxide going back to the year 1659. This is the Central England temperature record, longest thermometer temperature record set uh, available. And we can see here that the coldest temperature is actually the year 1695, uh, probably the coldest temperature in the last 10,000 years. It was in the middle of the Little Ice Age, the most recent cooling trend we were in. Um, Little Ice Age went from about, uh, let's see, it would be, uh, and ended in 1850. Um, and so it was... 1450, 1850. And so we had three, 400 years of very bad, very significant cooling. Uh, the, the warming trend that we're in uh, started more than 300 years ago, and that's significant. And notice that it started warming 250, first 250 years that had been entirely naturally driven. Let's take another look at the same data set with a little bit different scale. Um, again, we see temperature uh, warming slightly, uh, but really no correlation between uh, increasing atmosphere. This is the atmospheric CO2 now instead of emissions uh, in blue. Uh, again, no indication that CO2 is driving temperature increase. And then a little bit longer uh, viewpoint of CO2 versus temperature over, uh, over the last 1,000 years, dating back to the to the previous warm period, the medieval warm period, um, showing here the medieval warm period, Little Ice Age, and our current, current warming trend. Um, and again, why was the medieval warming period that was warmer than today? Uh, it couldn't have been driven by CO2 because we had very low CO2 levels on the order of probably 280, 280 parts per million. We're worried about 420 today. And again, looking even longer, if you go back, uh, there's a period known as the Holocene, which is from the, the Holocene takes the last 10,000 years of, of warming that were in interglacial period from the end of the last ice advance uh, to today. Uh, if we look at the last 8,000 years, 8,000 years ago, it was called the, the Holocene Optima. And that means the Optimas were the really warm periods. And again, so we've had a very, over 8,000 years, we've had a, a general decline of temperatures in red, uh, all the while carbon dioxide has increased. And then the really big picture, going back four and a half billion years, uh, again, temperature in red, CO2 in blue. Uh, there were times when CO2 was really high the temperature was both low and high. There were times when CO2 was very low and temperature was very low and also very high uh, because the Earth has cycled in and out of what are called either hothouse events or ice house events where Earth is very cold with ice at both poles or very hot with no ice at either pole. Um and again, this is this is talk. This this chart here is really relating the great rise of empires and civilizations uh, to the warming and cooling periods. Again, each of these cooling periods were related to crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation. And so I can I can exit this or continue on, no matter what you like. Well, if you'd like to. You know, present a little more on that. Absolutely, feel free. Um, I had another couple of like current issue um, things to discuss with you as well. Let's go ahead. Why don't you go, go, we can get back to this if we have time? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, the we're next going on an hour. We're going on an hour now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the the next one that uh, I had 
in mind was these uh, Kuhn and Desler debates, of which there's a couple, I think. Uh, now, that's another thing that we had on the drawing board for an inaugural national conference if we ever got things uh, significantly underway and found one or two sponsors, <laughs> unlike yourself, we're, <laughs> we're pretty broke. Um, but in our case, uh, it would be Ian Plymer, who you're well aware, uh, debating his opposite number, if you will, that's Professor Tim Flannery, whose famous quote was, uh, even the rain that falls won't fill our dams and rivers. And that was uh, just before we had record rainfall. He's well known for that one. He's been wrong about everything else too. But he wouldn't. We're absolutely convinced he wouldn't appear for that debate. So we're going to call it an empty chair debate. Now, you actually had someone from the other side, um, and that was this guy Desler, right, um, do the debate, Oxford-style debate. So... I'm aware that, you know, there was a clear winner, obviously. How did it go? How did you, you know, present that sort of thing to either politicians or other figures of influence? Uh, you know, what what traction did you get out of it, I suppose? Well, we had nothing to do with that debate, although I enjoyed it. Uh, I know Dr. Kuhn and Steve very well, and... Well, I shouldn't say I, we, we communicate quite regularly and uh, we, we've met a couple of occasions. I hope to meet up with him in London. Uh, in fact, I'm leaving later today uh, for a journey to London. I'll be arriving uh, early tomorrow morning. Uh, but it was really good. Steve Dr. Coonan uh, really just showed this guy up. It was it was embarrassingly that easily won the debate was by Steve. I've I've only done one debate myself because it's very difficult to find anyone to debate you uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, they say there is no debate. The science is settled. Um, and so there's no need to have any debate. But I did debate one. I was going to call him a gentleman, but he, he certainly... Uh, wasn't very gentlemanly, uh, but uh, I debated him at Cornell University. This was a couple of years ago, um, and it went pretty well for me, I thought. And we, we, we changed some minds of the students. There were about 250 students in the in the audience. It was a closed audience. Only the debate classes were were invited, and uh, so we get these we get these opportunities. Dr. Coonan also had just de debated two days ago another person, and I don't recall the person's name. Um, and uh, uh, our our chairman, Dr. Will Happer, who just returned from Australia, he did a five city tour uh, of Australia uh, with the group that you mentioned with Jennifer Marohassi and Peter Ridge. Is it mm. IPA or? That's the one, yeah. Yeah. And so he just returned from that. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we could talk. If you're putting this organization, put this uh, together in Australia, perhaps we could be of assistance. Uh, and we do have experts that might we might be able to come travel to talk. Well, that, that would be just great. That That's the intention is to try and, you know, not not just within IPA, which is a bit like the heartland, I suppose, equivalent. You know, they're on conservative issues generally, but they also have, a, you know, a climate end. But we've got um, a heck of a lot of other people who are, you know, very good uh, researchers and, uh, and, and activists in some case. Um, now, I'm not an earth scientist, which I put out there. Uh, in fact, I'm a bit Jordan Peterson-like. I'm a psychologist uh, and management consultant in background. Um, and I'm doing what I'm doing because, quite frankly, our country is on the brink of an energy disaster. Uh, unlike the US and Europe, where uh, an uber-woke state like California can always uh, get some spare energy, you know, piped in from other states, 
or gas from Russia or nuclear from France, uh, if, you, if you're Germany, whatever. We don't have a plan B, and we've just managed to shut uh, one of the key um, coal-fired stations at Liddell. And um, that is going to bite. Uh, there's one other called the Raring they want to close. And then the state of New South Wales will face energy uncertainty that will probably rival and exceed Texas, which, um, you know, is constantly monitoring during their hot summer. Uh, our own state will be affected the same way. If these insane Labor governments and Greens uh, have their way, then uh, we're in an almighty hole in this country. So we are really looking for options, support, whatever uh, we can muster. So, yes, we will certainly want to liaise with you uh, in in this whole process. Um, that is, uh, that's a particularly good one. Now, I wanted to get back to politics because that's something, again, we've been involved with. We said that our primary goal in forming this group uh, was to do community outreach. It's not something where we discuss in club, um, you know, latest developments, etc. It's what can we do um, to reach out to relevant people with our type of information. And that would include politically. Now, you're a Republican Party. In Australia, it's called the Liberal and National Coalition, the LNP equivalent. Now, I happened to chance upon an article this morning when I was doing research on some of your areas of interest in an article you did to Republicans called Say No. Say no, don't sit on the fence where it comes to, um, you know, the climate position. And also don't sit on the fence, we would say, in terms of uh, renewable energy projects. Now, we have that issue and probably worse than Republicans. I was really impressed, say, in your state, West Virginia, wasn't that the one where you took on um, ESG legislation as well, kind of a state leader there. I mean, fabulous. Um, but uh, within the LNP, we have some good people, some very good people, but not the majority by far. And we have the others who are either actively in the opposition camp and even invest in it, you know, people we call the wets from our perspective, um, and some people who are a bit nondescript. They won't stand up almost for fear of being identified as, uh, oh, you're one of those funny people, deniers or something, you know, uh, all this use of language and the way in which the pressure gets to people. So um, we've been doing a little bit of lobbying and I'll invite some of... Um, now, good people here to, to talk a bit about that. Um, you know, David uh, Denham, who you'll meet, will tell you a little bit about how he had um, a session with uh, a local politician here who is Karen Andrews, who's the shadow minister, David, I think. Uh, she was uh, shadow minister for science, but she's the shadow uh, home affairs. Okay. okay. Well, could we... Uh, how long are we going? Just question. How long are oh, we going to go? Well, could you could you stand, or do you need a cup of coffee? Maybe twenty minutes, half an hour, Max. Is that okay from your side? Okay, because I, it, it's it's uh, I have yet to. I'll be leaving in just a bit. I've yet to pack. I'm going leaving oh. for London, and. I, I've got yeah. about three hours sleep under my belt. I'm going to be traveling I, for I, 15 hours. Okay. So it's, uh, You've had an hour. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did mention the magic hour. All right. Look, uh, we don't want to, um, you know, impose beyond, you know, what what's reasonable. Um, but just a, a couple of comments from you in terms of um, the way in which you might be influencing 
politicians, and particularly on the Republican side, I'm sure you've got them there who won't commit themselves or really tacitly support the other side? Well, we we intentionally stay out of, particularly out of politics. We support, we will, we, I, I meet with politicians, um, but it's it's to give them the basic science to support the right policies. And we, we do support policy decisions and use our scientific background to, to inform politicians to make the right decisions. I do meet, I testify, but we're, we're, we're very proud at the CO2 coalition. We want, we want to stay nonpartisan, nonpolitical, and just stick to the science. However, what we do find is that uh, there's only one party in America that we found that it's even open uh, to climate realism, uh, but we'll talk to anybody and 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 inform and again it's our our role we believe is is one of informational provide the science the facts and the data that that, that support the fact that there is no climate crisis and uh, any money spent uh to fight a non-existent crisis uh, if it's one red penny it's one cent too many too much again fighting a non-existent problem yes and of course your natural home in, in all of this is the Republican uh, Party, I would take it. Um, so that's another area where we've got some of our people are members of the uh, LNP and uh, will take actively take opportunities to uh, spread uh, a message, our message to them. Uh, and we're anxious indeed to uh, talk to the younger groups called the Young Liberals um, as well in that regard uh okay well look gregor i think it's only fair that we let you um break off have a cup of coffee get things together we thank you very much for providing us well, let me let me, this let me do let me just do a bit of sales before i go please do so my my new book is a very convenient warming it's available in pre-publication at convenientwarming.com um, convenientwarming.com. You can look at it. I've got a a, sec, a section there. You can see some some portions of the book there. Um, it'll be hopefully hitting my warehouse and distrib distribution uh, here in about three or four weeks. Uh, I've got some pre 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 publication copies I've received, but I think it's a hugely important book, uh, providing this notion of the huge benefits of warming and more CO2. Well, thank you for having me here tonight or uh, early morning in my case. 